Hello, I'm Pat Tiford, the senior pastor here at St. David's Evangelical Congregational Church of Dover, Pennsylvania. Today is Sunday, September 13th, 2020. We are in the midst of a series of uh, lessons on the life of King David called David, Lessons from a King. And we are going to just dive right into uh, this uh, message. It's two chapters long, so we have a lot to cover, but it's a very uh, important uh, lesson for us to learn from the life of David. Uh, it's a sad part of David's life, but we can learn a lot from it. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. While you're turning there, uh, I do want to invite you again, like I asked last week, if you've been watching our messages online here through Facebook and YouTube, will you just drop us an email uh, to let us know that you're viewing this? We'd like to know who's out there. If you have any questions about what we've been teaching uh, and if there's any needs you have that we can be praying for and assist you with, please let us know. Uh, again, our email is ecc at comcast.net. Our phone number is 717-764-0033. So, okay, I hope you have your Bible ready. And let's uh, begin looking at the Word of God. Uh, I always start with telling you what the lesson is that we're going to learn from this. There's many things we'll learn from this passage, but I'm going to summarize it in one statement. Your sin always has consequences. No matter how large, how small the sin is, how extreme we think it is, how gross we think it is, or so light and, oh, this isn't that much, every sin has a consequence. It either, it always breaks our relationship with God, it harms ourselves, it harms others. There's ramifications, consequences to our sin. Please note that. All through scripture, you'll find that. Observe life. And that when we sin, we do suffer consequences. Maybe not immediately, but eventually. Or on the day of judgment, there will be consequences. So again, this start in God's word, 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Here I entitle this, David's Fall. David's Fall. It says, In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. One verse, we already got a point here about David's fall. What set him up for his fall? It says here, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. So winter is ended. The battle lines are being drawn up between nations and peoples. And the, the kings go out to war with their armies. But where is David? David is at home in Jerusalem in the palace. He remained there. Okay, where we, where we see this in the life of David, he's around 50 some years old. Life has been good now. There's been peace. The borders are settled for Israel. He has his wonderful palace. God has been blessing him and caring for him and his family. And so he feels that I can stay home. He still feels that there's no problem. It doesn't look like there's a problem. But what we find here is he was in the wrong place. He was in the wrong place. If David would look back on his life after these events that we just will see, he's going to say, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I should have been out on the battlefield. Why do we say that? Look at the following verse. Verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So he's in the wrong place. He's in the palace. He cannot sleep. So he walks out on the roof of the palace. And the palace was built into a hillside in Jerusalem. And it looked down upon other homes. And most likely what he saw was Bathsheba taking a bath on her roof in the evening. Perhaps very late at night. Thinking nobody would see her. But there was one that saw her. King David. He says he saw her bathing. He sent someone to find out who she is. And then he sent messengers to get her. And then he slept with her. Friends, he didn't resist temptation. He didn't resist temptation. Okay, so he's in the wrong place. And he's tempted when he sees this beautiful woman bathing. He should have turned around, went back to bed, but he didn't. He lusted. He wanted her. Sends someone for her. Seduces her. Sleeps with her. Then she goes home and time goes by and she discovers she's pregnant to David. He didn't resist the temptation. James 1, 14 and 15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. We're going to see this truly in David's life. He was tempted by his own desires, his lust. He was drug away into sin by his own sinful actions. And the sin grows and it results in death. And we'll see that literally in a few minutes. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not give you, let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So Paul's saying here, temptation is common to all of us. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He's there. He saw David lusting, wanting that woman. And he could have put it, showed David another way out, but David wasn't looking for that way. He will provide a way out so that you can endure it. Another man was tempted by a woman. His name was Joseph. He was in Egypt. Potiphar's wife was after him. Come sleep with me. He refrained. He would not see himself to be with her. But David, he was not like that. So he was in the wrong place. And he didn't resist the temptation. Verse 6, so David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. That's a term for sexual relations. But Uriah, so first, excuse me. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent from him. Who knows? A fruit basket with a bottle of wine, something for Uriah and Bathsheba. Little incentive there, little blessing from the king, maybe to impress. 
But, verse 9, but Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his, na- his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander, Joab, and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Here is an honorable man, an honorable soldier. The army is out in the fields going to battle. My commander's there. The ark is in a tent. Why should I go home to to a house? He said, I'm not going to do that. Verse 12, then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. And David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. He is spoiling David's plans. Verse 14. Here where things change quickly. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote... Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fierce. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. David's going to try to cover up his sin. He planned a cover up of his sin with more sin. He planned a cover up of his sin with more sin. Maybe your sin is not like David's, but there are sins you have done. And you don't want them known. So you commit other sins to cover them up. But nothing is ever covered up. In God's eyes, he will bring his justice. But do you see here, Uriah carries his own death warrant. An innocent man. And now David includes Joab, in his plan. Now, Joab doesn't know what's going on. I think he suspects there's something going on between Uriah and David. And David's now penalizing Uriah. And Joab's becoming now a partner in this, not willingly, but he's asked to put him at the front of the battle and Uriah is killed. But you notice that who else died? There were other soldiers of Israel that died. Sometimes our sins affects others who are innocent. He only wanted Uriah to be killed, but there were other good men that were killed also. You see the ripple effect of sin in our world and our lives. Verse 18. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know that they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerob Beseth? Didn't a woman drop a upper millstone on him from the wall? 
so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. So the messenger goes, going to tell David this terrible thing of loss of men. And he just says, remember, he says, David's going to say, remember this case of what happened uh, when you get too close to the wall. But he says, remember to tell him, Uzziah is that dead. Uriah is dead. Verse 22. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open. Well, we, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall. And some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, say this to Joab. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. That's a lot of scriptures there from verses 18 to 27. But what we see here is David had no guilt for his sin. No guilt for his sin. Verse 25, he told the messenger, say this to Joab. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as the other. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. David's not upset at all. His plan was carried out. So there was some extra loss of life. But Uriah is taken care of. And there's a time of mourning by Bathsheba. David now calls her to the palace and he marries her. And she bore him a son. And it says there, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Anytime we are in rebellion against God's will and we sin, we have the displeasure of God facing us. So how does this rest of the story, I think many of you know what this story, how it ends. We're going to go to 2 Samuel 12 now. 2 Samuel 12 where God reveals David's sin. That secret sin, they think they got it all covered up. That, oh, Uriah fathered that child. I married the widow. Look at nice guy I am. No, David, you're not. Some time goes by. We don't know really how long. But this is what we find. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. That's Nathan the prophet. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and he grew it up with him and his children. It shared his food drank from his cup, and he even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Verse seven. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. 
This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Amazing here. Nathan comes, tells a story. And he says, David, you're so upset. You're the guy the story's about. Verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, you're the man. This is the, what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And, all, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. You find, again, often God will remind us what he's done for us. He says, look what I did. I anointed you king. I delivered you from Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives. I gave you all Israel and Judah. Listen to this. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. In a sense, David, all you had to do is ask, and I would have given you it. Verse 9. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by, going, by doing what is evil in his eyes? Here's the main verse of these two chapters. God says to David, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? God has a standard. We are measured by that standard. He has commands for us for holiness and righteousness. And David, he despised the Lord by disobeying his commands. It goes on further in verse 9. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Saying, you used the Ammonites, the enemy, to kill, in a sense, your enemy, to cover your sin. Verse 10. Now, therefore, now God says, here's the consequences to your sin that you felt was in secret. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah to be, Uriah the Hittite, to be your own. David used the sword to kill Uriah. No, you didn't do it literally, but you did. You commanded it. The sword, violence, conflict, will now always be in your family, David. Verse 11. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. That's in reference to a few chapters after this this chapter, 2 Samuel 12, where Absalom, David's son, causes a revolt against David. And David has to flee. And his wives remain home and his concubines remain home. David left them there. Absalom takes his wives, has sex with them in public for the world to see. And God's predicting that and telling them this is what's going to happen. Verse 12, another key verse. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. It's going to affect the family. Ripple right through that family of David and his descendants. There's going to be violence, the sword. There's going to be the taking of his wives by his own son. Verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord. The son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had bore to David, and he became ill. Now, if you read the rest of the story of 2 Samuel 12, 
you'll find that the child dies as was told by God was going to happen. And you find how David addresses this and grieves for the child. I'd encourage you to do that. But what we find here is another point. Secret sins will be revealed with public consequences. You and I may commit secret sins that nobody ever knows about. But maybe in time, as we use other sins to cover them up, these other sins that we have already committed, there will be consequences that seem to be seen. If not immediately, maybe later, but it will be revealed. What is seen in dark, what happens in darkness will be revealed in the light, Scripture tells us. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And I ask you, and I ask myself, what sin am I concealing? What secret sins do I have? Am I resisting temptation? Do I see that God has a different path for me than to follow that temptation into sin? What is going on in your life? What are you concealing? It says, the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. David found mercy. He said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He acknowledges his sin. And Nathan says, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. God shows him mercy. David deserved death. But God was merciful. With this account here, David reflected on it. And he, you know, we know he's the writer of Psalms, many of the Psalms. He wrote two Psalms relating to these events. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. And I really encourage you to follow and read them uh, sometime very soon. And see David's heart. And may it be your heart when you sin, when you reveal your sin to God, you find his mercy. You find his grace. Acknowledge your sin and find that he can return the joy of your salvation as David describes it in these two Psalms. Let me just read two passages from these Psalms. Psalm 32, verses five and six through six. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Perhaps you're struggling with the guilt. There are sleepless nights. You feel you're wasting away. Your strength is sapped. Confess your sin. Reveal them to the one who already knows them and wants to show you mercy. He wants to rebuild your life. Come to him. Psalm 51, 10 through 12. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. That should be our prayer. That once we acknowledge our sin, that we confess it. And Lord, cleanse me. Create a new heart in me, a clean heart. Renew a loyal spirit within me that I will follow your commands, your will. Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. May your Holy Spirit lead me, show me my sin, convict me, and empower me to resist temptation again. 
Restore the joy of my salvation. Sin robs joy from your life. But God can renew that joy. It's all centered in the salvation that he offers him through his son, Jesus Christ. And make me willing to obey you. May you have the word and the Holy Spirit leading you to make you want to obey God and see that his word is wonderful. What was David's problem? He despised the Lord's will and sought evil. Friend, what is your life like? Do you have secret sins? Do you try to hide them and end up committing more sins in the cover-up? Do you see how your sins affects others? Innocent parties? And perhaps they don't even know why they're being affected by it. What's the consequence? What's the circumstances of why their life is being impacted by you? But it will come out eventually. Come out eventually. The lesson we learned today is your sin always has consequences. You know what? You can prevent the consequences by seeking what God wants for you. And that comes through hearing his word, applying and learning his word, and hearing the Holy Spirit show you the way and rule, convict you of sin so that you'll confess and repent and find the joy of your salvation. Men and women who have a heart after God recognize there's a path for holiness, and there's a path that leads to unholiness and evil. Which path will you take? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. And while we read this sad story of David and the consequences of his sins, oh Lord, may we not just point a finger at David and say shame on you, but Lord, may we use the word of God and hear the Holy Spirit say shame on you, for you are a sinner and you try to cover up your sins and your sins harms others. Oh Lord, we want to be men and women after your own heart. Lord, show us the way of holiness and righteousness that we can be men and women after your own heart and seek your ways. Restore us, heal us. May we find your mercy as we confess and repent and live for you. In Jesus' name I pray this, amen. Until we meet again, peace.